Okay, we are back online. Hello again, folks. Um, one of the benefits of membership is consultation. Uh, Barry and I do provide that. Hold on. Um, we provide uh, tutoring, troubleshooting. <laughs> Telephone consultations are normally free if we can solve it over the phone. With today's systems, that's becoming less and less capable of being done. Normally we have to see the system to find out what it's doing. Um, I had to go fix one last night. Uh, to show you the difference, he's not a member of MECG, he's my uh, brother-in-law. It cost him $125 an hour. For you guys, it is $50 an hour. If you go to Geek Squad, it's $200 an hour. Yeah, and yeah, and we guarantee with with Barry and I, if we can't fix it, you don't pay for it. That's true. Now, the um, his problem is his computer is running slower and slower and slower. I think I fixed it. I'm not sure. I'll find out today. And then I had to go up with a. She's showing full activity at her end. Okay, I'm showing nothing Wave to at the this end. Internet audience, everybody. Not not <coughs> not do that for. <laughs> Now, the conference room wire Wi-Fi is working just fine. Is but that not the port? Yeah, yeah, right. Which was working fine last time. Hmm. Yeah, we changed providers since then. So, um, uh -huh. I thought so. We do make house calls, um, and generally speaking, if it's within the Greater Sierra Vista district, there's no uh, travel charge. If we have to go to Bisbee, Benson, Douglas, Wilcox, Palominas. Elgin, Sonoida, Tucson, Phoenix, there's going to be a slight charge. I had to go up to Tucson yesterday to help a member out because the, the uh, his network wasn't working. I actually fixed it. I got the whole thing working. Okay. That's my phone number. You want that on Facebook? Yeah, I don't care. That's Barry's phone number. I'll take that <laughs> off. Um, okay. Questions? Too many questions so far? We're, yes, Bob. <laughs> club questions, not computer questions. Club questions. It's just I brought this into the club. That's why I. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, your your time is coming up. Okay, uh, share an app. Okay, the. Okay, good. I, but I do want to point out something. Barry posted on the list last night. Two sites. That I, I will the. Check last night's digest. It's a, stu a it's the same company that studies products, and they go to great lengths testing products, both computer products and um, home well, products. Like I was getting ready stuff. to buy a network extender, and I was getting ready to go up and do all the research on it. I went up to that site, looked up Wi-Fi extenders. They had already done all my research for me and had a recommendation, which I was shocked at. That I mean, it's so it's like consumer reports, but doesn't cost you anything. And they seem to be pretty good. Um, <laughs> so we'll uh, check the URLs in there. Okay, there you can tell us the rest of it. We're taking a pause for technical difficulties being worked out with the network. So in the meantime, the, the, the websites John was talking about is thewirecutter.com and sweethome.com. <laughs> okay. Now, we have two people with favorite apps. Carolyn, you go yeah. first. It's called Duolingo. Oh, it is. Oh, I'll That's tell you. Awesome. That is so cool. If you want to learn a foreign language and have fun doing it, Duolingo, which is available on mobile devices. Mobile devices and computers. It is designed by one of the universities as a different way to learn languages. It's fun. It, you really learn. Um, it bugs the heck out of you to keep up with it. It sends you emails if you It's don't. worse nagging than a wife. <laughs> <laughs> it sends you emails, notifications. You know, guys come knocking on the door. Why haven't you done your work? <laughs> Um, they have, what, 100 different languages? Oh, I don't know. It's at least... Uh, j almost any language you can think of, they've got. Oh, it's it's free. free. It's free. D-U-O-L-I-N-G-O. 
And their Italian is amazing. Their Spanish is amazing too. Yes. How's their English? Uh, it's available. Um, it's only available for mobile devices. So you have to go either to the Android store. Oh, I'm losing my connection again. It's available on computers too. I use it on it the is? computer. It is. Yeah. You use a website. Oh, time. it's even better on the computer than it is on the mobile devices. I didn't Maryland. know that. I, I was told it was only on. No, I found it first as a website. Oh. oh. Yeah, Duolingo is so cool. Okay. Now, we have another favorite app. I'll put. Let me put that up here. Okay. But yeah, that that is a really cool app. Uh, my wife started doing French. I was doing Italian. And it kept bugging me that why aren't you doing it? And it's repetitive enough. And not what's really cool about it, not only does it give you written and audio, but you've got to talk back to it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to write it. Yes, you've got to write, you've got to talk, you've got to listen. It's one of the few audio lingual systems I've seen that is very effective. But then how do you set up that talking switch? You just talk through your computer. You talk to your computer. You don't talk you to your have computer? A speaker on a, does your computer have a speaker? Yeah, it has a speaker, but I mean, does it have to have a certain, I mean, I mean, the talk? Yeah, how do you talk to your computer? I don't know how. You just talk to it. Well, I mean, I talk to mine all the time, but that doesn't mean that anybody on the other end is, is when, hearing when, me. When the program comes up and yeah, wants input from you, <laughs> it will turn on your microphone, it and will. you just talk. Oh, it will. Okay. There, there's, there's no magic. Well, it is magic. Yeah, it is magic. Yeah. Now, there's a chance that you're, you may have turned your microphone and speakers off. Yeah, yeah but you have to do that on purpose. Oh, I want another favorite app. Anybody have another favorite app? Okay. There are a couple of uh, <coughs> apps I got on uh, Google Play. Uh, the Spanish translator and talking in Spanish. So you type in a word, it'll speak it. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, the one I like, speaking of translated, and uh, let me tell you a story on this one. I translate. My daughter went to Japan last summer. Mm -hmm. I think it's summer. Well, I translate. Now, she does not speak a word of Japanese. Using I translate as her translator, she maneuvered herself all over Tokyo, managed to get to Disney Tokyo, spent seven days with a Japanese family who spoke no English, and they communicated back and forth. They both had I translate on their iPhones. Okay, and that is how they, they had a translator, they never used her. And Huh. The, from what my, my daughter told me, she says it was about 95% accurate. Every once in a while, it would, would, wouldn't work right, but not enough to be disturbing. Enough to where all the basic functions were taken care of, and they communicated just fine. And they still do communicate. She still communicates with her uh, Japanese friend. And what they do is she talks... My daughter holds up her uh, phone to the Skype, and it translates, and she does the same thing at a distant end. Huh. Skype, by the way, is working on a universal translator to be part of Skype for Business. Um, I think they've announced that. Star that. Trek for real. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, and it's code name of Hura. Okay, questions and answers. Okay, Bob, now you can ask your question. <clears throat> when I turn my iPhone on, yeah. in the lower left-hand corner, there's usually, not usually, sometimes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it says news, Yeah. and the other one says maps. Yeah. And unbeknownst to me at the time, I'm every time I leave town here, it tells me how, what, what turns to make to go home. Yeah. I know that already. I just learned it. So yeah. this thing is gobbling up uh, data time, right? No. Maps. No. Maps. Yeah. Very, very little. Very, very little. Well, I don't want. Why? Why do I need it to tell go, me that? So I. Okay. I, go I, into maps. I went. I went to uh, um, iCloud, and I went to permissions, and I went to notifications, and I turned everything off that the seven-year-old kid told me to do. Yeah. How is it using? It just says that's an Apple program, isn't it? Maps. Yeah. And it still appears down there. Okay. What? Okay. It'll still appear. Okay. 
Um, that's just little, yeah, very. Yeah, that little icon on the bottom left is just a, a shortcut. It's trying to predict what you might want to use when you activate your phone. So based on the context of when and where you do that, it's putting an icon of an app there. So if it's the maps may be showing up when you're in your car. The news may be showing up like a certain time of day during yeah. the morning yeah. when you yeah. usually would look at the news. It's just trying to give you a shortcut to go directly to that app when mm -hmm. you unlock the phone. It's not it's not using any data. It's but if I don't use, if I don't click on it, it won't. No, it, it doesn't it won't do anything. Launch that. Uh -uh. No. It's just saying, hey, I think you know, I think you may want to do this based on what you're doing. It, like um, <coughs> you see that when I go to Target, okay. That when I walk into Target, the little Target icon pops up on the screen mm -hmm. saying, hey, you're in a Target now, you may want to look at the Target app. When I go to Sears, it does that. When I go to Kmart, it does that. When I go to Walmart, the phone falls apart. Uh, when I go to Safeway, it does <laughs> You like that. Well, what, um, what, 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 what did you do to make that happen? Nothing. It's part of iOS 9. It's oh, part yeah. of it. Now, another cool feature, okay, which I just slipped away. Give me a second. It's a new app to help you remember things. Oh, <laughs> the, I just remember. Is it one of the things, and I don't know how this is working. I can just tell you what it does. <clears throat> is it, I'm driving. You know, I'm driving. Just drop my wife off at that at school. It comes up and says, "Oh, it is nine minutes to your home." Light traffic. That's the one. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, uh, well that. That's not. That is using so little data. It's measured in bytes. So don't even worry about that. Um, I was up in Tucson. Started up the car, turned on the phone, and said, "Oh, they come back? you are 93 minutes from there your home. Exactly. There is uh, moderately uh, heavy traffic. There is an alt route that you may want to consider." Is it is it also part of iOS 9, the thing you're just talking about? When you go over when you swipe over all the way and it's got serious suggestions and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those things appear there whether you want them or not. You yeah. can't get rid of them. No, oh, so just don't swipe that way. Yeah. It's just convenience. Oh. If you want to use it. Okay. Let's get moving on to today's topic. If you see a screen that comes up. This is Windows, specifically. A screen that comes up informing you that you've been infected with viruses. If it asks, is asking you for money, ignore it. If it is not asking you for money, then that is the Microsoft uh, virus detection system. Okay? They look almost identical. I saw it last night. I don't know if you've seen this one. Oh, it is, it's beautiful. I thought it was a Microsoft system. Because my brother-in-law was, you know, said, hey, I don't know what this is doing. So I took a look at it and says, wow, that, that looks like um, wow. a vendor. Eight viewers. Really? Hi, guys. We got eight viewers eight today. Eight viewers. Well, I'm um, one of them. <laughs> the, I'll fill them back to seven. And the only reason I could tell it wasn't the vendor is the fact that it said to get rid of these viruses... You know, here's you know, use your credit card. Microsoft doesn't do that. Yeah. By the way, there are a lot of scams going on right now. If someone calls you, unless if someone calls you, never give your credit card. Period. End of discussion. Do not do it. If you call them, then you know who you've called. But make sure that you do know who you've called. There's a scam going on right now. I've, I've heard about it. You get a letter in the mail informing you of something, the number to call. You think it's a legitimate business. The one that I was told about is USAA. You get a letter which looks like it's from USAA. And it says, there's a problem with your account. Can you please call? The woman called, she thought it was, they answered the phone as USAA, and they said, you know, your card. that um, your card is overdue, do you have a credit card? Fortunately, she was a little suspect, 
because she didn't have a USAA credit card. <laughs> that was her first clue that something might be wrong. So. Um, I have a problem with the scam. Uh, I don't know, these uh, emails that come in. Some of them are, um, they're, they're from familiar people that I mm -hmm. know. And that's the only way I know that it's not like mm -hmm. my brother or sister. And so, I'm, am I supposed to scam that? I mean, spam it or... or yeah, I mean, ignore it, it. Trash it. Yeah, okay. Because it's not going to go back to my brother to say, well, now you, you know... No, just ignore it. Trash it. Okay. Don't spam it because then that, that will block oh. a legitimate address. Oh. Possibly. You, you okay. <laughs> okay. Um... Bob, I will not ask any more questions for the next three meetings. I doubt it. Seriously, doubt that. I have uh, my Microsoft Office like you've got for mm -hmm. students. <clears throat> and part of that suite is, uh, I think it's one note or something. Yeah, one called. note. Okay. They told me on my laptop that I could uh, download one note for mobile devices. Yeah. I don't know if that includes Apple mobile. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know how to do it. I, you I, go up the App Store, type in OneNote, click Get. Oh, it's in the App Store? Yeah, it's in the App Store. I thought you had to, ha, has no. to be part of the whole suite. Of, no. Oh, okay. Uh, OneNote, I believe, is still free. For the, uh, yeah, you can download it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, prefer, I, I personally prefer Notes rather than OneNote, but that that's just me. Sir. But you had a question. Yes, you raised your hand. Yes. Um, this thing, this is an Android box. It's supposed to provide a wireless, a Wi-Fi hotspot. Yes. It brings it in on 3G yeah. and is out uh, mm -hmm. a wireless hotspot. Uh, doesn't I, I don't know how to get it. Is there are there is there a, a secret password you have to use to get in that capability? Yes. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot give that to you. It's too secret, isn't it? Yes. No. <laughs> what you have to do is, is you go into your settings, and if your service provider allows it, okay, there'll be a setting there called Hotspot. You just turn Hotspot on. And it'll ask you for a password, and that's the password you use for the Hotspot. Um, this thing talks to my router, my wireless router. My wireless router talks to the modem, and the modem talks to the device. Right. Wrong. For a Hotspot. It, okay. The hotspot uses your cellular data system, either LTE, 4G, or 3G. Okay? Yes. That, so when you have no Wi Fi router involved, you can go and use your phone as the modem. Yes. It's replacing that. And it's a setting in there, you have to go turn hotspot on, which means then you can go to your laptop and connect to that, to the, to the data network. Through your phone. The phone essentially becomes the modem yeah. slash router yeah. itself. It's, yeah. a, it's a settings. Uh, yes, it's called hotspot. If, if your provider allows it. Yeah. Okay. Verizon does because I use it all the time. This is the new data phone. Republic. No, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> That's why you can't find it. Republic does not allow hotspot. Verizon, Sprint, AT and T, and. T-Mobile, T-Mobile, T-Mobile yeah. allow hotspots. Really now, what's password. coming real soon now, it's safer even the, yeah. and I mean real soon, I right? hopefully before because June, you, you, your phone is both AT&T and Verizon have announced Wi-Fi enabled calling. Now, what this means is, it's is nine. Pardon? It's already been part of iOS 9, but it's well, car it, it's, carrier dependent. Yeah, yeah it, it's a little bit different than uh, FaceTime. What it allows you to do is... Oh, I know. Yeah, ...is use your computer as a cell phone, seamlessly. Now, those of us who are on the Macintosh and iPhones, iOS devices, have FaceTime, which is something similar. But it is not. It doesn't actually put you into the actual phone network. It comes real close, but not quite. Wi-Fi enabled calling means that your 
every device in your home will now be a cell phone. Yeah. Actually, because yesterday my phone, who knows where it was in the house, and I actually answered a call on my iPad because I oh, couldn't yeah. find my I, phone. Oh yeah, I do it all the time. So. Yeah, I just, you know, wherever I happen to be, the damn phone rings and I sit there and answer it. It could be on my laptop, it could be on my desktop, it could be on my iPad, my iPhone. It drives my wife up the wall because all of a sudden every every device in the house is ringing. Yeah, that's just it. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Well, I do. In, in Yahoo, I was trying to set up a Yahoo email. And I got to a spot where it said, give us your cell phone number so we can text you. Yes. It is a bit. Well, I don't have a cell phone, and it did not take my local number. Okay, so there should have been an alternative for mail. Yeah. 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 There, there should there should have been an alternative for other than cell phone. There should have been a button down just below that that says email is an alternative. Is that too far away? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't say anything. There, there Okay. I'll, try it. I'll try it again. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's to verify that, that you are, in fact, a real person. Chrome does the same thing. Yeah. Well, well, Chrome does the same thing, and it's, uh, you have a choice of email, or you can go to two, two different phone systems. Uh -huh. I might see it in my lifetime. I think we're back. I'm not sure you will. No, no. no. If I, if I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping to live to be in my 90s. And I'm hoping that gives me a few more years that I might see it. My daughter, I know, will. I'm assuming that she lives to be in her 60s. At least. You'll see what? A complete revolution of the way computers interact with people. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Emil's right, it's becoming too complex. In their attempt to simplify things, it's getting more and more complex without being simple because we're being inundated with ways of doing things. Now, how that is going to manifest itself, I don't know. More than likely, we are going to be replaced by androids who will have a better capability of doing it. That, that's a, the simplest solution. Yeah. Where's Somebody the, got it! Jeez! Where's the meat computer going to go? <laughs> oh, that's a comment. Another, yeah. another comment is we're going to have an embedded uh, computer that does these things powered by our bodily, bodily juices. That's like just a comment. My question is... No, I, actually... Uh, <laughs> No, it, it, what is more feasible is actually going to happen is that DNA-enabled computers. Those are right around the corner. Oh, yeah. They, they, a DNA-enabled computer. Now, you all know that computers work on the concept of on-off, okay, two-state. A DNA-enabled computer is a five-state system, okay? What, or is it four states? C-C-H. Yeah, it's four states. C-C-T. Yeah. When that, very good, not many people know that, okay? What that means is, is the power of computing is going to expand by a factor of, yeah, well, not, because you have to subtract out what we have now. So it's actually two to the third, more computing capability. Now, how that's going to manifest itself, we don't know, okay? We have, you know, the fourth state, the memorister, has been right around the corner now for 10 years. Um, we have DNA-enabled computers, which have been right around the corner for five years. 3D printing is now a reality, which 10 years ago was pure science fiction. I mean, if you look at the commercials that uh, Cox is giving on the Gigablast network, that everybody is 3D printing food everywhere. <laughs> you have to find it, but the... Uh, so, doesn't sound appetizing to me. Last week we didn't finish up the presentation on email. What I'd like to do is, are there any specific questions on email left over from last week before we go into word processing? Yes. Okay. So, oh. any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, well, regarding the email. Yes. Did you just briefly go over the steps? Okay. Okay. Yes. Sure, I can do that. Okay, what we're going to do, ah, come down here, go into mail, I'm going to have to switch over, I'll see if, this will. damn, if I do that, okay, what I'm going to do is come into to preferences, 
go over to accounts and the easy way of doing it is just click an add button choose the type of account that you have now what you will need is you will need your the email address the password and that's normally it if you're doing iCloud Exchange Google Yahoo AOL any one of those that's all that you need so when you created that account in that system or it was created for you that you'll have that information that's all that you need click that type in those two things if I do if I switch networks I lose the display okay. so that being said if you're using another provider such as you know Buno.us, NDC.org, Cox.net, you the other mail account you will need your email address, the password, and the mail server address. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that every one of the service providers out there has a help page for creating email accounts. Many of them have an automated script that'll do it for you. Once you have those three pieces of information, it's all automatic. The biggest problem you'll have is getting your password right. That is why, please, 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 when you create an account and a password, write it down. If you are over the age of 30, <laughs> write it down. If you're over the age of 40, write it down twice. If you're over the age of 50, write it down twice and mail it to somebody who's under the age of 50. <laughs> if you're over 60, have it tattooed in reverse on your forehead and get a teenage daughter who harasses you constantly about forgetting your... I, I swear, I've, I now get have a password 108 help. passwords. Get a password manager. I do. <laughs> I am running out of new passwords. You cannot use a password that you've used in the past 20 years. Yes, it doesn't have a Excuse password me? generator? Generator random. Generator random I password. hate those. Oh, uh, I don't. I love because them. Because I, I don't know what they're going to be. Okay. Yeah. Why is it? How bad is it to use the same password for different accounts? It depends on how paranoid you are. Actually, it only depends on if one of those accounts gets compromised. <laughs> That means every yeah, password very account you've used that password yeah. for is potentially <laughs> Okay, but let's let's say that you're using the same password on Yahoo, Google, AOL, if it even still exists, and your bank account. Okay? Scenario. My bank account, I always put over a generated password in. Somebody hacks your Google account. Okay. That means they can read your email which in my case isn't very exciting. Mm -hmm. They can send email under your name. Interesting concept. Now, what they'd also have to do is know that you have a Yahoo account, another email account, and a bank account, and which bank that is. Now, generally speaking, most people don't divulge who they bank with, nor your bank account numbers, nor your bank account login, using that password. Now I can tell you right now, I don't remember what my login is for my bank. Okay, I think it changes every three days to everyone I put in. That's why I have Touch ID on my phone. Okay, so somebody hacks your Google account. Oh my. Now, what is the ramification of that? Well, unless you've got information in the mail saying you have these other things, then not much. Okay, and contrary to popular belief, there is not a profile of you out there giving all this information to want to be hackers. Okay, they can't go in and you know, type in John Buno. Oh, he banks at the following banks. Here's his bank account numbers. 
here's his logins, here's his password. That doesn't exist. Yes, ma'am. Another thing that makes it, especially with the banking, at least all the bankings that I do, you can go in and put in your cell phone number and your email address, and every time you change anything, and I mean anything, it sends you an email, it sends you a text. So now you know that... It sends you three text messages, yeah. <laughs> four emails, and so it says a if, partridge in a pear tree. And it says if you didn't change something, then go into your, and change your email, you know, change your password on your... But yeah. it does that because every time I do, especially because I do a lot of it on my business mm -hmm. account, and it changes the password every three months. And every time I change my password, if I go in and download anything, it'll say, oh, you just did this, you just yeah. did that. Then I get all these emails when I get off the account. Now, one thing I do suggest is make sure you have fraud alert turned on for your bank to your cell phone. Mm -hmm. Give you a good example of what happened. Right. Three o'clock in the morning, my cell phone goes berserk. Fraud alert. Okay. Well, from Chase, I expect that because you know, they're paranoid. <laughs> You know, if, if they see any activity on my account that is the slightest bit out of my profile, they block it. National Bank is like that too. Okay. This one came from Barclay Bank. Okay, I do have a credit card with Barclay. I don't use it rarely. And this is a fraud alert that Zappa.com has charged $10 to my account. This looks suspicious. Did you do this? Well, no. I don't even know who's at the doctor. It's a shoe company, <laughs> especially at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I say, two, send it back. Well, within seconds, I get a plethora of emails saying that the fraud has been detected, the account has been shut down. I get calls, five o'clock in the morning, they're calling me saying, we're sending out a new card immediately. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, and they, they conducted an investigation, and it was somebody at Bookatan who had charged it. This is this, uh, just they did not get my number. What they do is they use a credit card number generator, and it goes through and tries to make charges until it finds a company that it'll accept the charge. Once they know it's a good charge, then and they can find out my name, they can generate a CVC. It's not. Generate. Yeah, the CVC number is a uh, algorithm. Is. The, oh, isn't yeah. that the code on the back of yeah. the card? Yeah, that's an algorithm, oh. mathematical algorithm. It's generated so by an algorithm. Generate yeah. that? Yes. Based on your credit card number. Yeah, your credit card number, your name, your date of birth. Um, what was the main algorithm? I forget what else is in it. But yeah, it, it's not easy to do, okay? The first thing they have to do is get a valid charge. And that's why the fraud alert, because within seconds, my account was shut down. How I mean, do you get a fraud alert? You set up with the bank. It's an option you have with your bank. All banks have it? Almost all of them. All major okay. banks do. Uh, who do you bank with? Wells Fargo and USA. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wells Fargo does. Well, Wells Fargo's a pain in the butt on fraud alerts. <laughs> okay. If, if they see something that is, okay, let's say that you take a trip. If they see that you are traveling, then you're okay, sort of. But let's say that as as you make a charge in Sierra Vista, and a half hour later, they see a charge in Tucson. That can't happen. Because the distance from Sierra Vista to Tucson requires 90 minutes. That charge is fraudulent. Wells Fargo will shut your account down like that. Unless one is Unless you're sharing an account, one person's in Sierra Vista and one person's in Tucson. Sometimes. Yeah, Chase does that. That happened to me when but, I was in D.C. You no, know, what they do is they'll send you, if you have fraud alert activated, they'll send you an alert on your phone saying, is this a legitimate charge? One is yes. And then I think it's fine. If you say two, no, it is not, then it shuts down the account. Now, depending upon your bank, with Barclay Bank, 24 hours later, I had a brand new credit card. The um, overnight delivery. I was very impressed with that. <laughs> Wells Fargo, week, two weeks, yeah. a yeah, year. You can go down to the, because one time, I by mistake, I left my card in the ATM, and the ATM will eat it if it, you don't take it up in 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Well, that happened to mine. The ATM ate my card. 
But you can go and get a temporary car until your new one comes in. Yeah. So, Bob. We do too. I was just going to <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Is that? Do they still have that? Oh yeah. Algorithm that you described. Yes. Okay. okay. What they what they're doing is one. Well, I've given an example. <clears throat> um, about five years ago, I went to Photoshop World in Las Vegas. I told American Express, I am traveling to Las Vegas, so you're going to be seeing charges you normally don't see. Thank you very much, Mr. Vino. We appreciate that. I get there. I go and make a purchase at Photoshop World of $100 worth of software. Blocked. Denied. Fraud alert. Phone calls. The company had made the charge to their bank in Boston. <laughs> so it showed up as a, and it was not triggered as, as a um, software or re, uh, remote access. It was as a physical, because that's what they did, is they called up and charged with your money. Can't happen. So I got to the, while I'm sitting, sitting there on the phone, on the phone, talking to American Express saying, yes, that is a legitimate charge. You can unblock the account. He said, thank you. So I appreciate that, okay? To be notified. Now, how often does this happen? Two weeks ago, prior to that, about two years, prior to that, someone did steal my credit card number and tried to charge a $5,000 travel package, okay? Oh, that one came up real on my debit card. <laughs> okay. Um, that's about it, it. It doesn't happen often. We did the same thing about three, four years ago. Uh, we were traveling uh, out of state, and uh, same thing. I was getting gas, and all of a sudden my card's defined, and I uh, called them up. And, yeah, I checked my phone, I got the text message. Yeah. And, uh, they will do it on gas because gas pumps don't check identification, and there's no signature. And like when my daughter was traveling uh, to Europe and Japan, we called up Chase and said, hey, she's going to be in the following countries on these dates. And they were tracking all the charges. And they got one that was out of sector. They called me up. I called my daughter and I said, is this a legit charge? She said, oh, yeah. I said, but you're nowhere near there. She says, well, that I, I bought it and the store is right here. I'm still in the store. So, any more questions on email? Yes, sir. In the technologies that good enough to do to like a, a, a charge um, refusal, rather than have to go through the whole cycle, call you. It seems like it's, it, it takes longer than it really should, given the technology. Oh no, it takes seconds. seconds. Yeah. So what? What if, what if tonight a transaction rather than uh, go to the uh, card holder? Well, it denies a transaction. Not cancel the card. No. Okay. The, it will only cancel the card if you tell it that the charge was fraudulent. They can't cancel the transaction. Oh, they can't. They, 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 they keep the guys the cards. Oh, no, they do. But they have all that. So it's as good as it's going to get. Yeah. But let's say, you know, what they do is they alert you. Okay, is this a legitimate charge? If it's legitimate, then they process it again and it's good to go. Mm -hmm. If it is not legitimate, the only thing they can do is cancel that account. Because that means the number has been compromised. And if they don't do that, then you're liable for up to $50. Well, if the, uh, the transaction is canceled, then the perp realizes that's not a good card. So it goes someplace else. That might yeah. cut but, down the hassle factor. Well, no, what they do is they record where that was done at. And yes, IP addresses go down to physical addresses. So they, they'll go and catch them. They'll find them, if they're within the United States. If they're outside of the United States, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. It's hard to say. The girl's car was compromised a couple years ago and during the investigation. They actually sent me the invoice uh, of the transaction. Oh yeah. And it had Carol's name on it and then an address in Virginia to deliver the stuff to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I just uh, said, yep, that's not my address, that's not my phone number, go get them. <laughs> Yeah. I uh, was in the Waco, Texas, and I filled up with gas and had a flying tray. 
Okay, one more question, we've got to move on. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Dan, back to when you guys were talking about the iOS 9 yeah. systems for Bob. Do, uh, and don't shoot me, um, do uh, the other phones um, other than Apple use iOS 9? No, that is strictly for uh, iPhones, iPads, the Apple mobile devices. They're the only ones who use iOS. Um, the last time I was at Verizon, the guy that was helping me fix my phone, which is an Apple, was telling me I should have, um, what's the other phone's called? Android? Yeah. That they're much better than an Apple. So Next time you see apps. that guy, take out your 44 <laughs> and put him out of his misery. He's probably uh, getting right, a commission for Trump. Yeah, he's probably uh, getting a phones. commission for trying to sell it. For okay. Okay. Right. Yes, they do. Android gives a much higher commission, or Samsung. Is a higher commission than Apple does. So unscrupulous providers will try and do that. Is one better than the other? No. They're pretty close to the same. I personally prefer the user interface on the iOS devices. I find the Android user interface to be confusing. Now, does that mean one is that you might like it better? It's all, you know, there's not enough difference between the two to switch from one that you're used to using. Now, I've got an easy way of solving uh, all of my email problems. I get about 125 a day. I download all of them and I immediately delete everything. Mm -hmm. no I got along without email for 75 years. I can get along with it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're That's a very germane question. Can I change my IP address? Yeah, I know this. IP addresses are linked to physical locations. Now, that being said, that can you change your IP address? No, not easily. Can your IP address change? Yes. Now, what happens is when you go onto the network, there's a little program called DHCP that goes up and grabs an IP address for you to use. The way the system works right now, 90% of the time you're going to end up with the same IP address all the time. It can change because it goes up <laughs> and says, hey, I need an IP address. Oh, we're going to give you this one. Regardless of what that is, that IP address is linked to a physical location. So if you are doing something which is not illegal, they can trace it down to your physical location easily. Not using GPS, just using the IP address and its physical location. That way when you call up like Comcast, you call up Cox, they can go and say, oh, that router is located at my address. They can physically find it. The FBI can physically find your location if you're doing child porn. Very easy. Now, what they can't do is the exact device that it's going on. Once it goes into the router, they can go to the cable modem. Behind that, they normally can say what is there. They cannot say to what device it is going to. Barry, let's take a five minute break. Yeah. <laughs> to our viewing audience, we are taking a five minute break and come back on right after the break. We're live. Okay, the question is, someone has seen a lowercase i preceding a lot of different things. What does it stand for? Well, that goes back to when Steve Jobs took over as the CEO of Apple 
and called himself the I interim CEO. That sort of caught on and we now have the iCloud. Some people say the I stands for internet. The What it actually stands for, no one is really too clear, nor does anybody really care. But when you see I, that normally means it works with the Apple mobile devices. Probably, maybe. All right, so normally associated with Apple. Yes, sir. Did Wozniak get anything out of this, or did he pull up books? Did he get anything Steve, out of Apple? Uh, Steve yeah. is doing very, 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 very well. He still maintains a considerable amount of Apple stock. Okay, you're not talking to Steve. Steve Wozniak. Wozniak. Well, well, the other Steve. You know, the one who tells very bad Polish jokes. Polish men from yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. He's, I think he's actually technically has a, an Apple employee ID number still. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm not sure of that anymore. Next time, if, if I see one, Steve again, I'll ask him. Yeah. He didn't have to go on welfare. No. No, no, no. no, no, no. Trust me, he did not. <laughs> he's okay. a billionaire. <laughs> um, now, I do want to cover, these are questions that members asked me about email prior to the presentation. One is, what is mail drop? Okay. Mail drop is something which Apple has implemented. I do not know if there is an equivalent on Windows right now. I know that Outlook doesn't support this that I'm aware of. Let's say that you go to send a very, very large file to somebody. Larger than the server will accept. Some servers have blocks at 1 megabyte, 10 megabytes, 5 megabytes. Let's say for some god-awful reason you want to send a super large file. Well, in order to do that, what Apple does is that they will take that file, they will upload it to their cloud server, put a link in the mail message to the recipient and saying, this attachment is too large, here it is to download and stay up there for 30 days. So it is a relatively nice solution to the problem of files being too large. Now, pardon? Yeah, Dropbox does something similar, but it's not as seamless. Yeah. Dropbox, you have to physically put it up on Dropbox, get the link, put in the email message. This is seamless to you. It's done automatically. So What, what happens after 30 days? It's gone. Right? It's gone. Well, that's my question. What does gone mean? It's deleted. No longer available. It is deleted off the server. The NSA As far as I know, no. But it's still available on your computer. It's still on your computer. It's just not on the server for the recipient to download. Now, with that being said, soapbox time. Uh oh. When you send pictures. If those pictures are larger than 100K, you're wrong. What you need to do is spend a few seconds, downsize those pictures to something which is acceptable to be mailed. 10 megabyte, 20 megabyte, 30 megabyte pictures, because I get calls all the time, I just tried to send you know, pictures to my son, daughter, grandmother, grandfather, whatever. And it won't go through. It says the file's too big. Yeah, it is. And for you guys out there, too. <laughs> There's four of them. Sorry about that. Downsize them. Can you repeat that? We didn't hear it on Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my wife. And if you're watching, Jane. Oh, Jane is actually watching. So I have to behave myself. Okay. <laughs> if you're using the Apple Mail program, when you put a picture in there, there's a little box that says size. Small, medium, large, actual size. Most people, medium is just fine. They don't need a picture the size of New Jersey. Now, what do you need large Seven. file sizes for pictures? If you're going to print them. When is the last time you saw people print pictures from your email messages? Oh, well, my mother-in-law does it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Lucinda's mother to call me. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Now, the, the size of the picture, the rule of thumb is one inch, one megabyte. So if you are printing a four by six, to the largest you need is six megabytes. Actually, you can get by with four. That's all that you need. You do not need to send a 10 megabyte file to print a wallet. And most people don't print anymore. When you post up on Facebook, it downsizes it so much you can barely even tell it's a picture. So you don't have to put up high resolution images. So, oh, yes. Outlook.com does support some version of the mail drop. Uh, if you try to send uh, an attachment that's too large, you'll get a message back that says, this cannot be uh, sent. Would you like to uh, send it to SkyDrive instead? And then it will provide you with a link that you can send out. Nice. Outlook? Outlook.com. Oh, Outlook.com. Yes. Okay. I was going to say, because Outlook. Not the client. Yeah, not the exactly. client. Outlook.com. Okay. Because I was going to say, I use Outlook. Yes. And I get the error message back all the time. This file is too large. What do you mean it's too large? It's only 172 megabyte. Mm -hmm. I accidentally did that one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the, uh, the you read the M and thought it was like a K. This one was uh, 10, 10 megs. Yeah, the, uh, that that one was so bad that the system administrator for work called me and said, "What in the world are you trying to do?" Because it set off alarms all over the place. Okay, so the other one is, and I get this call at least twice a month. Why do I keep getting asked to change servers? I never see that. You, you don't? No. Oh, I get this one at least daily. Oh. Okay. And in, yeah, she's saying, yeah, I see that <laughs> all the time. I have no idea what it means, but what do I do? Okay. What that means is, is the outgoing mail goes through a separate server, which may or may not be co-located with your email server. It is a feature of mail that you do not necessarily have to use the same server to send that you receive. With that being said, there's some people like Google that bastardize the system. That's why I, I refuse to use Google Mail. I do not like what they do with their email server. So, because they change the recipient. Okay. So, with that being said, if you get this message, that means that the SMTP server that's your postman picking up the mail is temporarily unavailable. Generally speaking, just wait. If you're using the Cox.net mail server, I guarantee you it's down more than it is up. <laughs> Why they're still trying to figure out? It only seems to be affecting Sierra Vista. They, they, they run into a big problem in Sierra Vista with the SMTP server not responding correctly. So just wait. If you go a couple of days and you still cannot get mail out, call me. And I'll try and walk you through and find out what's going on. Now you did have that, okay. I'm constantly did have that happen last week. Yeah. Oh, where I have that. I didn't get a happen. message. Yeah. Just yeah. What I do, I, 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 I switch two or three times a week. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What do you mean it changes the recipient? Oh. <laughs> Don't oh, no. Don't you got him on a soapbox again. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't here to. Two months ago, were you? Okay, that's okay. I barely remember last week. Okay, Google, in an effort to cut down spamming, has changed the way their SMTP server handles mail. So, if you are on, you have an account, somebody at Google.mail or mail or Google.com, and you go to send that. It will show up from someone at Google.com. But let's say that you have another account at Cox.net. Cox.net's SMTP server is down, so you decide to use, and it's perfectly legal to do, the SMTP server associated with your Google account. So far, that's okay. However, when the recipient receives it, they don't see the from address he is being Cox. somebody at cox.net. Google changes it to the 
Google mail address associated with that SNFD server without telling you about it. So if sneaky. Yeah. If the pre people receiving it don't know who that is, they're not gonna know it's you. And if they reply, they're gonna go on the Google account. Right. Exactly. Oh, you run into that problem too. You're saying that if I I have Google yes. and if I send an email to my sister that they can change No, 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 no. No. You have to have two email accounts. If you only have one email account and it's only Google, this does not affect you at all. I have Yahoo and Hotmail and But and what this is is if you have a if you have to be on a client, okay, not through a web browser, but on a client. And you go to send a message from the Yahoo account, and you get this message up here saying SMTP servers down. You have the option of selecting a different SMTP server to send that message. If you select the Google SMTP server, it will send the mail message. However, it will change the from addressee to the Google mail account. Which, by the way, is a violation of the, R the SMTP RFC. You see, I've never got that message. How do you change the SMTP? You won't, you won't get a message. It'll just do it. Yeah. Well, normally what happens is, is that you'll get a, a window saying, I, I can't send this message. And there'll be a pop-up. If you uh, turn this on when you set up your account, you'll get a, a pop-up menu that lists all the SMTP servers available to you you can select a different one if you have not if you've never seen that before that means you never activated it yes so don't worry about it but for some that it is activated that Google changes the from address what in your mail preferences you can say for any given account always use this one specific outgoing server Let and, me show you. and yeah. then it won't prompt you if, uh, to change it. And it'll just tell you. It'll just tell yeah. you it's not available by it's default, in the mail. By default, it is turned on. <clears throat> okay. Let's go up to... <laughs> Bless you. I don't know if this is going to come through on the video. Okay. You have to go into edit SMTP server. Advanced. Um, geez, I don't know where, where is it now. Use only this. Where's the option? It's a, it's not under advanced. No. Son of a gun. Is it is it on just the main settings page? Not on the sheet, but just these are the SMTP servers. Huh. Oh here it is. If, yeah, it's just under general. Oh, okay. If outgoing server is unavailable, show a list of alternate servers or automatically try sending later. Well, that's, but it is changed. Because yeah, it used to say is, only use this server. Yeah, yeah this that account. has changed. I did not know that. I didn't either. Huh. See, we all learned something new. Okay. Well, I only installed El Capitan about two weeks ago. What would you recommend then? Yeah. Um, it's and I'm using the mail client. Oh, just um, was there an option to use only one server? Or no, I, but I'll tell you what, what to do. Okay. I mean, I want to use an anonymous one so that what I when I communicate with businesses, that's the only email address I'll ever see from. If outgoing server is unavailable, automatically try sending later. Okay, so it'll keep. Don't show a list. Me. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can show a list. Just if you do that, never select Google. <laughs> right. Okay. For your retail business, well, never select that one. Right. And I'm wondering, should I take, should 
The only reason I got Gmail was because this and this is years ago it's probably changed, but Cox would not work in certain countries that I was in. And so but Gmail did. And so that's why I have a Gmail address. What I would recommend doing now is going up you, Cox allows you to have multiple email addresses. Right. Okay. I would go up and establish a Cox email address and stop using Google. For anything well, how about just using my um, Okay. You can use that too. Right. Yeah, that's fine. So on my Mac, if all I have is the iCloud, then everything will go out to the iCloud? Yes. But only with that address. Right. And it won't get jumbled up. So if I do my personal and my retail and my professional and with separate email addresses, but at dot iCloud, then you're just fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only person that changes this is Google. Nobody else does that, okay? And that's only because a, a, a corporation can be a person. Yeah. <laughs> Brady. Yes, I'm speaking of servers. I just heard you earlier to say that Cox was having some uh, aggravating problems with the server. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you that God can last, you know, occasionally. And sometimes seems to improve a little bit, but then I'm inundated with email and regular mail from Cox advertising and food and faster <laughs> And uh, yeah. how, something is not right, what's going on here? How can they offer a faster system when the one that they have is not working? Really okay, well. let me explain to you marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Sierra Vista Cox is a tiny little dot in the great Cox world, okay? Everybody out there has got better service, okay? They're trying to get you to upgrade your service. I can tell you, talking with the Cox engineers, they think they have found the problem. How many, within the past two weeks, that problem with Cox dropping out on you? Still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Past week. week. Yeah. Okay. The past week. They, they are working on it. Okay. The, they're not sure, but they think they know what is causing the problem now. But I have to reset my modem right. two or three times a week. And I'll go, yeah, I'll, I can see it's up, down, it's Why upstream. Yes. yes. It, it, it's Alice is having the same problem. You're having it. I'm having it. It is not your equipment. There is something in our area, it's Grady, the, the, the town and country area, that is causing the problem. Well, okay, I, just well, I, I want to think it's a software problem because I've had uh, a guy come out and he said that uh, my circuitry is fine, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So the only yeah. other thing that I can think that is a, is a software problem. Well, it's sort of a software problem, okay? Yeah. What, what is happening is the configuration that is held locally in the Cox mainframe is getting out of sync. Yeah. And so they shut us down. You reset the modem, it re-downloads it, and it comes back up. Well, if, that me, if you recognize uh, this upgrade that they're peddling, no. it's going to be won't have any, It won't have any effect. It, it's a different issue, Grady. You'll get faster speeds, but you'll still lose it on occasion. Yeah. I'll, let me take Tony first, then you might. Tony? So, when, when you're talking about this issue, are you talking in the geographical area of Sierra Vista or is this in specific location? It seems to be isolated to town and country two and three. Oh, okay, I, I, I don't see the same issue. That's why I'm yeah. It, it, it seems to be isolated to that region. You go outside of that region, it does not appear to be a problem, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I live in town and country, and I want to switch from Central to Cox. Yeah? Cox came out and they said, oh, your line's been cut or something. And I said, really? And they said, well, we, yeah. And so I didn't, they, they said they could rewire by digging up the whole yard, you know, to get a connection box. And I said, oh, well, forget it. Um, 
that. I don't know if they meant cut or if they meant that some critter had chewed on it or that the wire it, was just what, bad. Or okay. I don't know if they the CenturyLink and Cox is two different wiring mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. It right. is entirely possible that at some time that someone did cut that cable accidentally. That happened to us, and they had to run a whole new cable line for us yeah. in the J-Box. It was the city that did it, yeah. accidentally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Also, the fact that the J-Box was under three feet of water every time it rained. Um, so that, now it won't cost you anything to have them do that. Oh, I know. I, I just, it will from a yard, though, and they have to go under the wall, under the concrete, oh, under, yeah. the, yes. under the, under the, They won't pay for all that. <laughs> they're not going to pay for all the replacement of my flagstone. They're, they're going to run no. it a different route to get to you. Yeah. Well, I might check on that again yeah. if that was the deal, but that wasn't the deal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, three things then. First is, there definitely is a problem upstream because I reset my modem, I watch the lights, and I reestablish locally. It's the upstream last sink that's not coming in. Yep. Second is, if you haven't been... Put a profile on it to see yeah. what happens. Uh, as far as cabling, if you haven't used Cox for a while and you're going with Cox Internet, you'll probably need to have a new cable put in anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I when I had Cox uh, Internet put in, my cable was good enough for regular television. It wasn't good enough for Internet, so yep. that might need to be replaced. <coughs> Third thing is, a friend of mine just moved in down the street from me, and he's trying to cut off the cut the cables of mm -hmm. the television. So he was looking into the Cox Ultimate package, the 300 megabits. And one thing I was not aware of, he said they told him that if you get that, one thing you get with it is a static IP address and your own dedicated connection. You will not be sharing. They want to guarantee 300. Whoa. You get your own dedicated connection. That's, that's available down here now? Uh, that's the ultimate package. For Cox. For Cox. Whoa. $100 a month. How much? $100 a month. $100 a month. A hundred dollars a month. Dollars a month. But they have guaranteed you that 300 megabytes by giving you a dedicated uh, pipe. That's what they told me. Because I, cause I was told that was not available in Sierra Vista. Huh? And wouldn't be. It's not Gigablast. It's not Gigablast. No, I know it's not Gigablast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what they told them. Huh. Interesting. Well, yes, sir. Would that be more geared for businesses than the average Yes. You would, you Unless would, you want to watch a lot of streaming videos. Yeah, because his whole <laughs> thing is he's getting rid of uh, satellite TV and Cox television. He wants to do all of his television viewing uh, over the Internet, and he's got four people in his family. Yeah. That's what he wants to have. Is, uh, and that gives him, I think, it's two terabytes of, uh, of streaming a month. I could use that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, three things. My ISP gives its feed from Cox, and my feed stops at 1 o'clock a.m. consistently, and they don't have an answer to that. I have Gmail, and trash and spam seem to work pretty well. Stuff gets stuck with yeah. it. The, the problem I'm asking about is I get a lot of uh, spam for myself. Yeah, I have too. So, what's going on there? So stop spamming <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody just grab my IP address, my uh, email address. Do I, do I, oh yeah, do I spam it? Um, how that, okay, how does that happen? Okay. Explain what you mean. Your own address comes to the Yeah, my own address is me. It's labeled as me. You know, it changes it from my address to me. Yeah. And sometimes it's from me, and sometimes it's from me as a spammer. Yeah. And you can pretty okay. well tell what's a spam thing now. Let, let me explain to you how, how this works. The, there are programs out there that people have written called bots. And what they do is they crawl through the internet looking for addresses. Now, one of the places they get addresses from is from people who are immoral and unscrupulous <laughs> who forward messages and don't remove addresses from a forwarded message. Now, I'm sure that none of you do that. That you do not do the vile and despicable act of forwarding a message with addresses in it of other people. Now, when you do, when unscrupulous, immoral, nefarious people do that, Eventually, it's going to wind that message, believe it or not, is going to wind up with someone with less than stellar morals. Mm -hmm. And they will go through and grab those two or three thousand email addresses and use that 
to conduct spamming. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two or three things that spam does. One is gets you to go to sites to buy stuff. Canadian pharmacies, by the way, never, listen to me out there too, <laughs> never order any medicine via the internet. Anything <laughs> medical, unless it is from a reputable source that you know of. Canadian pharmacies on the internet are not Canadian. reputable. Okay? There has been case after case after case of people buying expensive medication via the internet from questionable sources and dying. Now, if you want to do that, fine. I'm not going to stop you. But they go and grab these email messages and then use it to spam. Now, some of the spam is for buying stuff. Some of it carries viruses. Now, what do the viruses do? Well, a lot of the time what they do is go in and grab email messages to send back to them for more spamming. Or it goes in and watches your keystrokes and sends back the keystrokes to get your credit card numbers. There's all kinds of things it can do. That's where those come from. At some point, somebody had your email address available to a bot. So what do you when do you it click? Nothing. Oh, just nothing. You, there's nothing you can do about it. Change email addresses. Yes. That I have a Yahoo account, or hot list, Hotmail account, I have never touched. Ever. In 15 years. Because all it is is spam. Yeah, Tony? Question. I understand what you're saying about the people putting your addresses in there. Mm -hmm. If you go on to one of the web pages to say you do a search for something, mm -hmm. medical, I can look it up, something's on there. Or this thing about this new government flashlight thing. Oh, yeah. Would be a good example. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty careful of not checking the wrong boxes and things mm -hmm. like that. When I see them, I shut them off. How is it that possible doing this can get their e your email address, saying that it's not coming from another source? Oh, it's very easy. Okay, let's send that you send me an email. Whatever's in it, I forward it to somebody else. No, not that. Okay. Because somebody would know at that point was I looking at the government flashlight? Right. That's supposed to be really powerful. Yeah. Or some particular medical procedure that I was looking at. Nobody yeah. else would know that. Yeah. And yet I'm getting emails into my Hotmail account going to these specific web pages that I've been Okay. <clears throat> There's a couple of ways that can happen. Now, which way, in, in, in your particular case, I can't tell you exactly, but the when you visit a site, that site can request your email address, unbeknownst to you, and unless you have it turned off in your browser, that the cookies maintain We'll grab that. Anytime you enter your email address, you go up to the site and ask for your email address, it gabs that and it can do anything it wants to with that. More than likely, when you visit that site, it asks you for an email address. You gave the email address, okay? Then it's grabbing it out of your cookies. Or, um, that's where it's probably coming from. Well, I've gotten the exact same advertisement on the flashlight. And so have I. Everybody's getting oh, it. Oh, oh I, yeah, I get about 20 a day on that. Okay, John, then, then the other side of this here with the cookies. Yeah. Uh, my particular bank that I deal with requests that I have to use cookies in order yeah. to get online all the time. Yep, absolutely. And I, and I think more and more banks are going to this procedure. Yeah, yeah. there's good reason for it, too. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure it is because what happens is if I say delete everything then in the last hour that I'm on, it may take my cookies out and then I go on the internet banking again, it takes me to another page that says I have to dial a telephone yep. number I expect. So then if that is the only protection you have. 
That's the only thing I can think of. And because what more than likely that the stuff that you're getting is probably not coming from cookies. It's coming from some other detection device. Um, and it's hard to say. Okay. Let's. John. Yes. Um, on cookies, if you delete all cookies, mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm working up to this idea. If I have all cookies deleted from my browser, then I'll have to retell everybody my um, email address. No. No, not at all. One is nothing to do with the other. What, let me explain you what cookies are. Okay, well, let me just say one thing. I have a financial institution mm -hmm. that doesn't work well, doesn't play well with um, Mac. So I have, I have do not accept cookies from mm -hmm. But if I want to go to this institution, I have to go in and uncheck that and then, mm -hmm. and then go ahead and do it. I changed the bank. Yeah, really? yeah, really? mm -hmm. yeah, I changed banks. No, 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 I'm not going to do that, but that, that's, that's one of the things that they say they're working on. It. It's yeah, because there's no reason why that. <laughs> let, let me yeah, tell you what, what cookies that. are, okay? One of the rules of the web browser is it is not allowed to store locally without your permission. Not allowed to do that. It is not allowed to access anything locally. What cookies are is an exception to this that allows your web browser to store very small amounts of data based upon your visitation. Mm -hmm. They can be read by that site. That's what a cookie is. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you visit a site and it will record the date you visited what you did, it's all, that's what the cookie does. So when you come back, it remembers you. Because it's not allowed to store anything remotely on your visit, unless it asks you, which is the sign in and information. So, but cookies develop to where that a third party could come in. Now, what is a third party? And this is what you're thinking. Your bank has got two different certificates. I just figured out what it's doing. Two different certificates to validate that you are in fact you. Those are treated as a third party cookie, which means if somebody other than the person you're visiting is allowed to store information and retrieve information from your browser. So if it's that two different, and that's not a bad way of doing it, it's just that today there are much better ways. That's the way we used to do it mm -hmm. when you had no other ways. And now we have actual certificates. So that that's what it's doing. That's why it's going to turn that on. It's just clunky. Yeah. And it is a their end to get a new certificate issued to get around that problem. It's a very time consuming process. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see sometimes the certificates don't match or I can't identify that. That means that, hey, you're visiting site A. This certificate says it's site B. They don't match. Is this legitimate? Just to protect you. No! No! Whoa, whoa! Stop! Somebody just used a foul word in here. I never want to hear it word used again. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a foul, disgusting concept. Do not use it. If you want to use online banking, payment, PayPal. Oh, PayPal is PayPal excellent. PayPal is a new service, too. Oh, you know what, though? What, which one in particular? They have a lot of new services. No, yeah, they do. They are, you can, uh, haven't done it yet, but you can link to all of your, <coughs> all of your accounts to PayPal and you know, send it out to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PayPal works. Bitcoin don't use Bitcoin. Stay away from Bitcoin. Yeah, but I found things from PayPal that says, uh, like, uh, $20 or something on the PayPal account, and I don't even buy You know, I mean... It's probably not from PayPal. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. Always check. Well, they have some promotions with these new services, yeah. though. If that, you may be... Because they'll say, 
uh, you know, sign up for this new service uh, and you get a twenty dollar credit. credit or something. Go to the account. Account. Don't go to the this link. sounded like somebody, like it, it was something that I was going to have to pay for. No. Then it's not from PayPal. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of PayPal scams. Yeah. Uh, by yeah, the way, if you get a spam PayPal. in from like your bank, it's questionable. Um, like my wife gets from, it looks like USAA. Okay, forward that to abuse at the bank dot com. Like USAA abuse at USAA dot com, abuse at Chase dot com, abuse at Wells Fargo dot com. They will, because that email message contains all the routing message. You can't see it. It's there. And they can go on down and find out exactly who sent that, mm -hmm. send out the Gestapo, and eradicate them. Mm -hmm. So how do you know it's a USAA scam? No, you don't have Look at the from address. Well, I do bank with USAA. Yeah. Look at the from address. And is it USAA.com? If it is not... Especially if they're asking to validate your um, account. Your account credentials, yeah. Yeah, your account credentials. USA does not do it. No or bank or does. No your bank. Change, change your yeah. password. Like what Chase does, I think is great. They <laughs> sent me a message saying I have a message mm -hmm. on my account. Mm -hmm. They don't even send me a link right. to get to that. Yes, they just said, account. you know, you have a secure message at your account. Visit your account and check your secure message. USA yeah. does that too. Okay, yeah. I get those from USA. That's yeah. That's how a bank will actually communicate with you. They will never send you a message saying go up to your account or put it this way. Now, I did get one from one of my banks that did that. Okay. And I looked at it and I, I don't know, I forget who it was. It was Chase or Glenn Becker. And I looked at that and I said, oh, no, this, this is somebody messed up big time. So it was, yeah, it was one of my credit cards. Said you know that it was a legitimate so saying with a link to go to it, and I called them up, and he said, "Thank you, Dr. Green, I appreciate that." Yes, we know. And the person who sent that out is being dealt with. Mm -hmm. And about five minutes later, I got a message saying, "Please ignore that message. It was sent out mm -hmm. inappropriately." Okay, let's get on. I, I want to talk at least a little bit about word process. Yeah, because we don't want to push it. Up. <laughs> Okay, what I want to do today is talk about the three major word processing programs and show you some things you may not know about. Like, how many Windows users do we have in here? Okay, how many Mac users do we have in here? Okay, any open office users? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, what I want to tell you is for Windows users, you know that Apple's program for the Macintosh and iOS is Pages. Okay, it's a good it's a good little program, very simple to use. They have a Office suite, like Microsoft does. It is Keynote is for presentations, Numbers is for uh, spreadsheets. But you own Windows machines, so you don't have access to that. Wrong. If you have an iCloud account. And I know you do because you have an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have full access to the online versions of those programs. So you can use them from any web browser on any platform anywhere in the world. You didn't know that, did you? Mm -hmm. <coughs> surprise, surprise. Yes. Now, how about Microsoft Word? Well, Microsoft Word is a subscription service now. And you can have it on your laptop, your mobile device. I have Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, all on my iPhone, my iPad, my desktop, my laptop, and on the internet. I can go in from any browser on any computer, public or private, and access those programs and work with them. Same with pages. Now. The, let's take a look at, the, I'm going to go through the contenders. Microsoft Word. Well, Microsoft, part of the Office suite, does cost money. It's not a subscription service. It's $10 a month, more or less. And no longer do you have the $395 for Office, 
for the office suite. Ten dollars a month. It's updated quite often. If you're on, um, you get Excel, PowerPoint, Word, OneNote, and Outlook as your mail program. So you know, on Windows, suite. doesn't it include Publisher now, too? Well, I haven't gotten that yet. I think so. On Windows, it includes Visio, Publisher, and one other program that I can't remember. Access? Or is that separate? The database? And Mike, do you know what the status of Access is? I've heard Access has been no longer supported by Microsoft. Oh, it's supported as far as I know. It's just they've never, or they've never offered it as part of the standard... Uh, Office suite. Yeah, anymore. It's always been. It's always been like the professional version. Yeah. As far as I know, it's. Oh, like speaking of which, um, if you accidentally install the home version of Microsoft uh, operating system, mm -hmm. and you were supposed to do the premium version, how can you change that? Uh, I'm guessing that there's probably an up update or yeah, upgrade so. option. Uh, okay. I'll, I will. I will look. Because I did that. Okay. Um, now, a little bit of history. Most of you may not realize that Microsoft Office, Word in particular, started out as a Mac application, and it was ported to Windows. So it, it has its roots on the Mac, as did Excel, as did PowerPoint. Now, what Microsoft did when they introduced Word, the king of the word processors was WordPerfect. <coughs> that was the de facto standard in every office, every government agency throughout the known world and most of the known galaxy. Microsoft didn't like this idea. So the marketers at Microsoft came up with probably the most brilliant marketing concept I have ever seen. What they did is that they, with every copy of Windows, they gave a free copy of Microsoft Word. Free. So if you ordered a computer, you got it free. And they said it will stay free for a while. Three years. Well, I'll tell you right now, when people saw free, okay, Word Perfect was $2.95. Word, which wasn't quite as good, a little bit harder to work with, was free. All of a sudden, government agencies were saying, hey, we don't have the money to pay for this anymore, so we're going to use this free product. But some of us were saying, ah, but it's not always going to be free. At some point, you're going to have to pay the fiber. Well, the free with, version still work? What? Does the free version still work, or has it been disabled? Oh, we're talking about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. 19. What, what, Windows 3.1? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Windows 3.1. You still want a 3.1 problem. Okay. <laughs> so within two years, this was 1988, if I remember correctly. Within two years, WordPerfect had been replaced as the standard, and Word had become the new standard. Everybody wanted everything in a .doc format. And they issued an upgrade and charged for it. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, all of a sudden, when Word documents were now the de facto standard, Microsoft came and said, "Oh, we're going to start charging for this now. The free versions will still work, but the paid versions have all these additional features." Within five years. Word Perfect was out of business for all practical purposes. It was one of the greatest marketing ploys of all time. It's written up in, in you know, classes of marketing. They use that as an example of how to really screw the public, which is what happened to this. Because you end up paying more for Microsoft Office. Now, let's fast forward. The uh, About five years ago, we started seeing subscription services coming out. And this is where ways of, some people say screwing the consumer, some people supporting the consumer. It depends on how you look at it. Where you no longer buy software, you lease it. Now, 
the single biggest advantage to this is piracy. It eliminates piracy. Because what happens now is that I can go on with my subscription for Office. It goes up and checks to see if I have a valid subscription. If I don't have an immediate internet connection, I get it for 30 days. After 30 days, it stops the program from working until I go up and validate the subscription service. So you can't pirate software anymore that's on a subscription. You can't pirate the Adobe products. You can't pirate Word. It just doesn't work anymore. Well, the reason they did this is that Microsoft said they were losing over a billion dollars a year to piracy. I've always questioned those figures because I feel the people who were actually using pirated software wouldn't have bought it to begin with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can tell you now in the Orient, which used to be the biggest... Pirate. Pardon? Pirates? Yeah, pirates. That Office is no longer a pirated software package. That pirating has almost disappeared. Because of the subscription? Subscription services. Because you can't, do it, you, you can't pirate anything anymore. There's nothing to pirate. Okay? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, we now see, as part of a suite of programs from Microsoft Office, it runs about $10 a month. Um, you can get student versions of it. I mean, it, it's very low cost. And honestly, for what you are getting, it's well worth it. Um, as opposed to $495 for Office, I now pay $10. Well, I don't even pay. For my, uh, I have three subscriptions. None of which I pay for through work. Yeah, Tony? I'm going to disagree with you, John. Uh, from a business point of view, that may be fine. But for the average person like me who uses office, that you really have to use, mm -hmm. you pay $10 a month, and you maybe not use it for a good percentage of the year, but it's a lot of money. They, they have programs for just that. that you can go in <laughs> and not activate it for months at a time. They, they have provisions for that. At least Microsoft does. Adobe does not as far as I know. Yes, but the alternative is is that you use a different product that does not have those restrictions. There are two products. One is Pages, which will read Microsoft doc doc documents and export them. The other one is OpenOffice which will read and export. The native format is different. The exported versions are about 99% compatible. Oh, and uh, Google Docs have the Gmail account. Yeah. Um, I have yet to get Google Docs to work correctly with the uh, reading Microsoft documents and really? exporting them correctly. Yeah, I've had nothing but trouble with it. Oh, I don't have any problem at all. The, um, I had problems actually in putting pages into it, but I don't have any problem in putting Word into it. And I've seen my students have trouble with uh, Open Office trying to bring that in. They have to convert it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, okay. with Open Office, you have to. Okay. With Open okay. Office, the yeah. ODT yeah. format yeah. is not Word. Yeah. Okay. Um, the one thing about Word is that it's feature rich. They have to save it as a document. If you can think of something you want to do to a document, Word can do it. Now, you may not be able to find it. Yeah, but Word can do it. <laughs> In the um, interface, you mean? Some some people <laughs> consider it feature burden. That's a, a, a term you hear because there is so much to it. And it was available first on Mac, now Windows, and most mobile devices. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> what, you know, what about um, Sidekick and WordStar and QEdit and TSE? They're all gone. And my favorite from I the day TSE. right now. But they, they seem like they get orphaned by the technology. <coughs> yes. Like, yeah. I've got programs that won't run on Windows 95 anymore. Well, uh, WordStar. Uh, on, uh, WordStar Word was 10. the king yeah. Oh, yeah. for many years. <coughs> then they didn't keep up with technology. The uh, keyboard shortcuts that we use for all the programs, yeah. Control-V, Control-C, those were all WordStar. Yeah, because yep. WordStar yeah. wasn't really a graphical interface kind of program. And the WordStar said, you know, the graphical user interface will never... Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, that's a quote. 
will never take root in the business world. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates said you never need more than 64K. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, I have this uh, Office 365 right. student who was 50 bucks for three years, I think it is. <coughs> And just this morning, I asked you about uh, OneNote, which is part mm -hmm. of that suite. And they said you can download it to my mobile device. Yeah. Yet, when I purchased Office 355, it only allowed me two devices to be able to install it on. The student edition may have limitations. Okay, that is two desktops. You can download the entire Office suite free for your mobile devices. Yeah. I can? Yes, yeah. absolutely. You don't have to have a subscription to download into iOS. And, you, and there's some limited functionality, but... It, that yeah. is you probably. Yeah. yeah. W w would they do this from within my Office 365? No. No, no. No. You go up to the App Store, you type in Microsoft, Word, Excel, and you download that app. And all the... Word and, and yeah. Excel at all yeah. come to my laptop? I mean, my yes. mobile devices? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, if you want to save it off in the cloud, then you'll have to have your right. account. You, you will, okay. The, what, what does Microsoft call it? Uh, Skype Sky right now. Uh, or OneDrive. OneDrive. OneDrive, one drive, yeah. You have to have a OneDrive account, which you have because you have 365. Your documents are automatically saved there. To get it on, you your, get desktop. It on your Mac. Oh, it's just for the Mac. Yes. So but this is free. The mobile devices yeah. is free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Problem. I'm done. And then it has interchangeability with my lap. Once I have Office here, I can do something on Office here. Absolutely. I do that all the time. In fact, I'm going to try and show that. Okay, this one is Pages. It's from Apple. It's free with almost every new Macintosh. Um, if you have an older Macintosh before it was given away free, it's like nine ninety five, and it's very inexpensive. Uh, pre Mavericks, I think. Yeah, pre Maverick. After Maverick, it's okay. always been free. Uh, but you can't you can't buy it on the Apple App Store anymore, even if you haven't. I don't think, unless you've already had it had it installed, and then you can reinstall it under. You have to go to your purchased. Ah, okay. History, but it's not listed. The older versions aren't on. Oh, yeah, that's on, correct. On there anymore. The older, um, version. the older, the older yeah. versions, yeah. It was the. I know the older version is four years old. There you go. Okay. It was designed as an alternative to Word to be a very easy to use alternative. Very low cost. Now we were talking about a price difference when. Word was three ninety five. Pages was twenty four ninety five. So we're talking about a major price difference, with a lot of the same features. Now Pages is free. It's been free for about four years. But it only works on Apple's. No. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Here is my. Um, it's on uh, the end. Maybe five. If you don't have an account, you can create one. It's relatively simple. This is mail. Now, I'm on the web browser. Okay, I could be on Mike's laptop. I could be on his phone. I'm accessing this through the web browser. At the library on a public computer? You could be at the yeah, library on a public computer. Mm -hmm. I have access to my mail, contacts, my calendar, my photos, my iCloud Drive notes. <laughs> These are the same notes that are on my phone, my laptop. If I come down here to my laptop and open notes, it's the same notes. This is the iCloud version. This is on my laptop. It's the same thing. Now, I'm going to go back. Pages. Uh, I'm As soon as I show you this, I'm going to switch back. The, um, just to show you that, yes, it's there, and it's free. And I'm not going to screw around anymore. <laughs> Zoom works really well. Oh, okay. 
This is as of last night. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, my computer oh. says they've got... Oh, okay. Apache's probably moved it back. Okay. Yeah. I When I went and downloaded it, it's open almost by Apache. Okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I I was surprised, too. Probably had everybody confused. And so it is designed <laughs> as a free alternative to Office. It is feature-rich. I would say it has probably 98% of the same features as Office, of which 50% you'll never use. I mean, there's stuff in Office that, why? <laughs> Who cares? Like what? <laughs> yeah, John. The style boxes, for one. The way it handles styles, the way it handles graphics. I mean, it's got so much stuff in there. Who cares? Um, some of the advanced kerning features. To who? Typographer. Designer? If you're a graphics designer, you use InDesign. You don't use <laughs> Office. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, Bob? Since my working days, I, I kind of lean on Word. Yeah. And I try to do the things you know, I just make a really thing for me. Mm -hmm. But I noticed as I was, like especially when I was, when I was taking courses here, if you want to give something to somebody else, Word, the universality of word. You know, Which is why every program can export to word format. Now I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So that is not an issue. No. I use pages and I export it to word. My daughter uses pages, exports it to word. She hates word. She refuses to use it. But all of her assignments have to be word. Absolutely. The only thing that's different yeah. is uh, one type of calendar. Mm -hmm. Ariel is so close right. to collaborate that you can't tell the difference. Right, but I mean, it always gives you that thing, and then, yeah. then they just develop how they just develop sentences. That's the software. new operating sy system for yeah. yeah. I mean, these little spite, spiteful spats. Yeah, well, well, the thing is, is it like APA? or MLA, APA, the Saw Guides for Students, um, <clears throat> solve that problem, Times New Roman, period, in a discussion. Mm -hmm. That's all you're allowed to use. But we're going to talk about types in just a second. Which is um, an ugly type. Open <laughs> Office is an amazing product. My problem with it is I think the user interface is not up to the same standards as pages of Word. Yeah, last time I looked at it. Can you export? No, file formats. Yeah, there's not an like there's not an official version of the application from the Apache group for, for mobile, mobile devices, devices <laughs> but there are other third-party developers who make applications that will read that format on mobile devices, on tablets and phones. Okay, here is an explanation. Word native format is .docx, which for those of you who are geeky is an XML format, which is why there is a huge difference between .doc and .docx. The .docx is now the de facto industry standard for all word processing documents. Or .doc, they both are acceptable almost everywhere. Yes. When I'm doing, I have a lot of archive stuff in Word, and it's doc and lately when I do something in Word, it doesn't get, it doesn't append the uh, format, and I go I go to settings and I say always you know put the format and it won't put it in and I have to type in docx and I don't know what the difference is. Yeah. No, don't type it in. It's yeah. just invisible. It's there. It's just invisible. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. The but what's the implication of Opening one in DOC and one in DOC after okay. anything? Yes. Okay. <coughs> if you open the document as a DOC document, it will only save it as a DOC document. You need to convert it to DOCX. Does it ask me to do that somewhere? No. Uh -huh. You have to do a save as. Uh -huh. And do a save as and make sure you say the mm -hmm. file format is DOCX. Uh -huh. The difference is, is that many of the features in Microsoft Word 
are only supported in the DOCX format. It is a much more robust format. It is a much easier to work with internally and is much faster. The two formats are not compatible indirect, indirectly. You can open one with the program and backwards compatible. But if you change a DOC to a DOCS extension, you'll corrupt the document. Oh yeah. Um, that, that's the same with, with, with uh, Excel? Mm -hmm. Yep. And can just, you clear, can you and, um, it just solves so many problems for universal formats. Now, working with it sometimes can be interesting. So, pages. Its native format is dot .pages, which is only readable for pages. However, you can export the doc .docx or to a PDF file easily. And it reads docx. It reads docx and, and doc. doc easily. I forgot to put that down there. Um, so you could go back and forth. The only thing that you have to worry about is table of contents and indices. Everything else is, for the most part, is supported. <coughs> Tables sometimes can be a bit tricky mm -hmm. um, because Pages does it differently. Pages actually embeds a spreadsheet where Microsoft creates tables. Mm -hmm. So that might not work sometimes. I've not had a real hard time with it. Exporting, importing sometimes I have trouble with. Mm -hmm. Now open office, its data format is dot ODT. Mm -hmm. Office document text. That's what it stands for. It is XML, but it's not the same XML as dot DOCX from Microsoft. Hmm. Supposed to be a uh, standardized format. So there's no point. Oh, Microsoft uh, extended again. <laughs> the two are not. It, Mike, you have to see the headers. The XML headers are different, mm -hmm. so you cannot read one as the other. Office will not read an ODT file. Mm -hmm. Open Office, huh? It won't. You're right. Yeah, Open Office can read Doc DOCX easily. You can export easily to .docx from OpenOffice. No problem at all. So you have the capability of universal file format. Them for doing it, try to develop a universal word processing document format called RTF, rich text format. It was the predecessor to the .docx. Why it failed, I don't know. It's still out there. You can still yeah, use I still it. use it. Nobody supports it though. Nobody liked it. I do. I well, a lot of a lot of apps I have support it will read it. Well, not not in the office business sense. Yeah. Okay. People didn't like the idea of converting. Um, yeah, Tony. Why is that file so much larger than using DOC or DOCX? What RTF? Yes. It's almost triple the size. Yeah, that's because of the way Microsoft generated the RTF format. Um, RTF is not true XML. Had it been true XML, it would have been about the same size as the .dsex. Um, it's, it's never been updated. But they, they did try, and unfortunately now we're stuck with .dsex as a universal format. Um, the major advantage to keeping .docx and using Word is if you do a lot of table of contents or indices, then yes, stick with Word. Because you have to go back and regenerate the table of contents. It's not compatible. And so far, that's it's always been that way. So, here's what Apple Pages looks like. Now, I will tell you, and we're going to end today probably with one demonstration, and we'll need to make a decision of what we want to do next month. The ruler is not open by default. If you want to see the ruler, and I always recommend you have the ruler showing, is just go up, view, show ruler. 
Yes. Command on it. Where is the one that shows you the, where you've made a paragraph, you know? Turn I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. okay. I'm not there yet. All right. Just wait. Be patient, Marion. <laughs> why do you recommend always have the road? You'll see why when I get to it. Okay. 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 It uses a pain metaphor. Okay. You still have your menus, but you see the paint over to the side? That's where everything is done. Um, like pains on a window. Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> not A-I-N. You see that right there? P-A-N-E. Pain. So your document's in a window, and you have controls in a pane of that window. Yeah. That's, how, that's, why that, that's where that um, When that first came out, there's a lot of controversy over it. Um, at first, I hated it. The more I work with it, the more I like it. Yeah, because you used to have a floating panel or a palette. Yeah. That, uh, Especially, so you got, you know, separate. you have icons. By the way, you do know that these icons are customizable. You can go up and change those icons to anything, you not anything, but change them, add, delete, put up new ones. And the way to do it is hold down the option key and click in the pane. The, the wooden vein up here, and you can go in and customize it. We will talk more about this. Marion, I will ex exactly answer your question. And you'll see why I, I kind of cut you short, and you'll see it in a couple couple slides why. Microsoft Word uses a ribbon metaphor. That's this thing up here. I hate it with a passion. I find it very difficult to use. It will sometimes... It was worse in the previous version, though. Mm. Yeah, it's gotten a lot better. <laughs> and they've also implemented a pane. You can see over here in the sign, you can bring up a pane. So it looks a lot like pages. <laughs> Word used to have probably the finest user interface. And then they changed it when Vista came out. And... No, I think it was when Windows 6 yeah, came Windows out. Windows 6? Uh, 2007. Ah. It came out with Windows Yeah, 2007. All, all the people I read about say that uh, Word 5.1 was the best interface. Yes. <laughs> okay. At least on the Mac. <laughs> it is feature rich. It won't get into more features. Open Office is totally different in the way it approaches the document. When you first open Open Office, by the way, this is Open Office. I mean, it's downloaded. Last night, or is that before? Right, right? says Open Office right yep. on it. Is that all of these are in one application, not separate applications? Huh. And they call their word processing document a text document, even though it is not a text document. You can see it in a text format, though. Oh, yes? Oh, I'm sure. And lose all your formatting. So once you open it, it looks remarkably like pages. Mm. And it's almost the best of both worlds. Mm. Now, yeah, I, Mike, I did the same thing. I said, boy, they really improved it a I lot. download it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I thought, too. Now, the reason I said what I said is the most often asked questions I get is how do I do tabs, margins, columns, hanging indents? And Marion fell right into that trap, I said. Because that's what she was asking, how do I do that? And that's what I'm going to show. And that's why you want the ruler, because you have to have the ruler to do those things. Yes. Well, you don't, but it makes it so much easier. Yeah. yeah. And I apologize for getting short, Marion, but you fell right in. I'm asked, that's what I I'm want, asked. I want to see, because somebody sends me stuff. She doesn't use word I want, and it used to be that I could show, and it had a little icon um, to show that. Little icon to show that, so I can go in. And show invisibles. Yeah, it's an invisible, invisible character. Yes. Right, yeah. Okay. So you asked, you were asking the wrong question with the right answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, what I want to do. That's one thing I. That's another thing that I would add to. Always show your ruler. Uh, I think it's helpful. I like, I, and I recommend always show invisible characters so that you know where the spaces and the return characters are. Mm -hmm. They're not going to print, but you can see them on the screen, and then you then you know for sure. In pages and show invisibles? Yeah. Now, I'm going to show each of these different programs 
on how to do certain things. And what I forgot to do... In 10 minutes. Next time. <laughs> I, I, do, you, do you mind if we pick up next month here? With the do I mind? Huh? Sounds good. Sounds good, yeah. What do you mean, do I mind? Let's, let's everybody download oh. all three mm. programs and work with them. And hey, that's a neat idea. Yeah. <laughs> let's all write a document. And bring it. <laughs> um, it's homework. <laughs> You know, what we could do is, if you bring in your laptops, is actually you could follow me in the demonstrations. Because what I forgot to do is download the Ipsum document. No. So I had text to work with. Oh, you can Thank get that you online real easy. Yeah, I know. Have you got enough plugins for everybody to bring their laptops? Yeah. You know, we could run some extension cords. There's a cabinet full of them back there. Cabinet full of extension cords back there. <laughs> for that very purpose. So when people bring in uh, laptops, no. We won't be able to use the internet with everybody. Um, but, but they don't charge us extra for electricity. I do know, it, we, we seem to be doing this every month, never finishing. That's because everybody's got questions. And if you have questions, I want to answer them. Because, I mean, that's what we're here yeah, for. That's right. Yeah. That's part. So tell your friends, tell your relatives, go out and tell perfect strangers. What I'd like you to do for next month is come in with things that you'd like to see. You know, how do I do X? And I'll show you how to do it in all three programs. Uh, like Marion, show invisible. Okay, how do you do that in Word? How do you do that in Open Office? How do you do that in Pages? So, do we have any other questions? I'll notify Jim. Change the topic. What was supposed to be next month? I have no idea. I, I don't honestly don't remember. I don't either. Um, but we'll continue the work process. And please, you know, if you have something in particular you want to see, email me. Put it up on the digest. Post it to our Facebook page. That way, if I don't know how to do it, I can look it up. I have no idea what this means. Do you know what that means? Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next month. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs>